Thanks for being here, everybody. I know this has been a little bit of a crazy time. And um, we're just so delighted to have Dr. Kerry Weiss with us. Kerry, wave. Hi. <laughs> Kerry Weiss is a uh, Kerry Weiss is a psychologist with Ocean Waves Wellness in Ocean Township, and to speak to us tonight about strategies for getting through this challenging time and coping with our stress as it relates to other and whatnot. So, um, Jewish Federation is just so glad to be able to add this to the the sort of basket of resources and connections that we're providing during this time and the main night in room together we're we're in this together and um, if you need anything don't hesitate to call please check out our page of resources at jewishlifeonline.org and uh, someone you know is in need that's what we're here for so um Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce officially Dr. Carrie Weiss. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you again to the Federation for having me here tonight and uh, for this special program. I think it's a great way to just support our community. And as Lisa just said, for us to come together, even if we can't be in the same space, we can still support each other, be there for each other and still share this connection. And so much of what I spoke about last week, and we can certainly keep talking about tonight, is having that shared experience. We may not have the same physical space. I really like the term physical distancing a lot more than social distancing, because I think that speaks to what we're really doing. We can't physically be in the same space, but we're being as creative as possible. And thankfully, we have technology to really help us stay connected in different kinds of ways and we can talk about some of that tonight. I'm not sure how many people were with us last week and tonight, so um, I did a lot of talking last week and thought tonight may also be a nice way to have people check in and share their experiences a little bit or ask some questions if you have some questions as we go along. I know Lisa sent me some ahead of time, but a couple of things I just wanted to point out. So Last week, I talked a lot about some of the themes that are really having an impact on how we're feeling. And if we think about this impact, it really helps to normalize and provide a context for why we may be feeling these deep feelings of fear and anxiety and uncertainty and just overwhelming uh, sense of sadness sometimes, just worry about things. So some of the main themes are dealing with the suddenness. We weren't really prepared. Uh, we didn't really think it would happen to this extent in our country, where we would be essentially on this lockdown and not really knowing what to expect. So it was pretty sudden. We also have just the massive impact of it all. So the massive level in a global way, so it's not just an isolated incident affecting one part of the world, there's a global impact and there's also a massive impact on every single facet of our lives between our social connections economic um, the structure of our routines families trying to manage work and schooling their children at home or supporting your children if you're grandparents and how we're managing this um, families feeling really disconnected so all of those things are just having such a massive impact on all these parts of our life we also have that uncertainty and the fear of the unknown. We're not quite sure what's happening next. We have some guidance as we listen to um, just different government officials speaking and updating us on what's going on, but we're not sure where things are going to be in a week, in a month, over the summer. And that's leading to a lot of questions and this feeling of out of control. We can't control everything that's happening we don't know what all those next steps will be. And we don't have a roadmap right now. We can't outline what those next steps will be. So when we think of just adapting to change, adapting to little changes can be really, really hard. And now we're adapt adapting to these massive changes in all areas of our lives without having a roadmap of what to expect. The social distancing is another just tremendous theme right now, leading to a sense of just isolation or disconnect and that profound sense of disappointment and loss. We are collectively grieving so many things that we're missing out on. Our family members are missing out on. Some that won't get to be replaced, 
some that may be postponed and rescheduled, and some that are just going to be really different. Another thing that's new that I was thinking about this week and dealing with some questions from my clients in therapy are, why am I feeling worse? I thought I should be settled into a routine by now. Like we've been basically stay at home for a couple weeks now. I should have a rhythm going. I should feel better. And I think some people maybe may be accepting that this is kind of our current normal and this is the way that we're living. But for some people, it's feeling bigger because the timeline is just unclear. And as more time goes on, things may become more complicated. There may be deeper feelings of just being overwhelmed. I think there's also this sense right now, if you're listening to the media, of the apex is coming. And what does that really mean? And what is that going to mean for us after we hit this point where hopefully things will plateau and then we'll start to see that decrease? We're not really sure what that means in terms of when some restrictions will be lifted and when things will start to go back to whatever normal is going to come in the future. So there's a lot of increased stress and anxiety and lots of increased losses and sense of grief as more time goes on and we're missing more things that we would have been doing or experiencing at this time. Kids may be having bigger feelings, just like we may be having bigger feelings because they're expecting to go back to things and that gets harder and harder. And I think another one, especially in considering our Jewish community is it's Passover this week. So this is really different for us when we're used to traditional ways of celebrating the holiday. We come together for holidays. We invite people in who don't have a place to go or religious organizations provide um, seders through the synagogue to have a place for people to just feel connected. Passover is celebrating themes of freedom, of liberation, of renewal. And we're not really feeling very free right now. We're feeling very stuck. We're trapped and disconnected. So I think it's especially important to just be aware of all of those things. And I said last week, and I'll just continue to talk about the greatest guidance that I can give, especially as a therapist, is to acknowledge how you're feeling. Just recognize what you're feeling instead of trying to push it away and saying, oh, I shouldn't feel this. I should feel something different. Why am I feeling this way? Is to stop and say, I'm feeling this way because this is really hard and this is really overwhelming and I'm missing things that are important to me. Whatever you're feeling, you might be feeling sad, you might be feeling anxious, you might be feeling a mix of all of those things. But most importantly, the greatest tool is to just recognize what you're feeling, to validate what you're feeling. If you're speaking to loved ones and friends and they're sharing their feelings, to listen and just validate what they're feeling as well. Uh, some level of joint commiseration can be really helpful but we also don't wanna get stuck there. And that's where we talk about some strategies to how to balance both, to have our feelings, but also to invite some other things in. And that's a great way that I like to look at it when we're talking about fear and anxiety or sadness, is not to try to get rid of it, not necessarily say, I need to make this fear go away, or we will get the, how does this anxiety go away? What do I do to get rid of my fear? We don't necessarily want to get rid of it because we can't just pretend it away. We can't say, oh, I'm not gonna think about being scared anymore. So instead of trying to pretend away those feelings, it's just trying to invite something else in to say, I can feel scared, but I could also invite in something that may be calming or soothing or relaxing. So you might be able to invite in some ways to feel peace and calm some ways to meditate or do deep breathing that might bring that sense of calm or relaxation onto you. So different ways that you may be able to slow it down and invite something else in at the same time. Another way is that option B idea. What else can we do instead? What else is the next best option under the circumstances? How can I find something else that may be an alternative, something I can do at the same time to go along with what I'm feeling right now. And those may be helpful ways to do both, to be able to acknowledge how you're feeling, validate that you're feeling this way, and also to invite in other strategies. 
some of the things that we were talking about in terms of those strategies, maybe like I just said, the breathing, the guided imagery and meditation, repetitive actions, that's for walking, may be really helpful. Um, jumping up and down, blowing bubbles, doing knitting, crocheting, uh, bouncing balls, bouncing a ball against a wall can be a great release of anger. All of these repetitive things, artwork as well, like a constant motion of coloring, of painting, they're rhythmic kinds of action that can be very soothing and calming. And that can be a very helpful way to bring in some peace and calm. We'll save some time at the end of today to also do that guided imagery. And the guided imagery uses something called vis visualization along with the deep breathing techniques. You can practice guided imagery using apps like Calm or Headspace, but another way to do that is also to visualize a really positive image for yourself. So you might want to think about what's a calm place for me? What's a safe place for me that I can think of based on my own experiences or based on some place that I would like to be that feels really safe and calm? I think for a lot of people that might be imagining yourself at the beach, imagining yourself by the lake, imagining yourself in the mountains, something that feels really relaxing to you. And you could imagine yourself breathing in that peace and calm and exhaling any of the stress or tension that you may feel. You can combine what's called a grounding technique with that visualization by thinking about ways that you can really connect to that scene. And when you ground yourself, your brain, so anxiety takes you to the future. It goes and revisits your past with all that what if thinking, all those spiraling thoughts. Grounding techniques bring you right back into the present space by connecting you either to the space that you're in or using one of these scenes to ground you. And when you ground yourself with your senses, you ask yourself, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What do I smell? What does this feel like? What am I touching? So you take yourself through your different senses and that can help distract you away from those negative thoughts that you might be experiencing. So those are just a couple of strategies that may help you really ground more in the present moment. So I wanted to be able to open it up to some of the questions that you might be having in addition to responding to some of the questions. I guess we could start with a couple of the questions that we have. A couple of the questions that I got in advance that some of the people had written in were how to cope with what if fears when living alone and far away from family. So dealing with the what if fears, I think when our minds start to think about that anxiety and things that we're afraid of, we can get into that what if spiral. What if I get sick? What if somebody I love gets sick? What if this doesn't get back to normal? What if I can't see my friends or loved ones? And the anxious mind can take us through all of these different things. And that can be very, very overwhelming. So I think this is kind of a two-part question. So the first part is managing the what if fears. And that goes with what we were just speaking about a few minutes ago with breathing, guided imagery, grounding you in the present moment, Another idea is something called chunking, to try to separate your time into different pieces that may feel more manageable. The what ifs are so future oriented. We could get so lost into these what ifs and then they take us down this rabbit hole spiral. And that can be really just providing so much anxiety. So anything you could do to ground in the moment and separate it into pieces of time. Instead of thinking about what may be happening months from now, we want to bring it back into a time period that feels more manageable. And it may feel more manageable to say, I'm going to think of one week at a time. I can look at this week. I know what I need to do. I know what's under my control in this week. I can control food shopping. I can control getting a food delivery. I can control getting fresh air. I can control making plans for a virtual Seder or some way of staying connected. So it's keeping yourself really grounded in what you could stay in control of during this chunk of time. When you start to think about the what ifs about the future, even if it gets to that next week, another way to respond is to ask yourself, is there another possibility? 
So when the what ifs lead to the worst possible case scenario of all the terrible things that could happen, because that's where the anxious mind can go, we want to bring it back and say, what's another alternative? Is there anything else that could happen? What if I don't get sick? What if my loved ones don't get sick? What if we do get back to a normal routine in the next couple of months? You could start thinking of alternatives that may have a little more positivity there. What's another possibility? If we can't think about another possibility for ourselves, sometimes we could think about other possibilities for our friends. So another strategy that I love is to say, what would I tell a friend? If they came to me with these catastrophic, uh, catastrophic thoughts about all the worst case scenarios, what would I say to them that would be different, that might be reassuring, to try to come up with some possible alternatives? The next part of that question really dealt with, what do you do when you're living far away from family? So I think after you're challenging the thoughts, it's really talking about that disconnect. And when we're feeling disconnected, if we're far or even if we're not that far right now, we're not able to see each other in person. So it might be thinking of what are creative ways to stay connected? What can we do that will allow us to still feel like we're sharing an experience, we're sharing a connection, we're seeing people that we love? As much as you can do things that have visual connections, the better it is. Talking is helpful. It's great to hear someone's voice. Texting may help people to feel like you're connecting, but nothing beats being able to see someone and seeing someone else smile, seeing how they may be feeling by getting that visual connection. I think it helps us feel so much more connected than just the speaking. So the best way to stay connected with family who may be living far away or family you're not able to see right now is to stay visually connected through FaceTime, through these Zoom meetings, um, through any other apps that allow you that direct facial connection. If the facial isn't possible, phone calls as much as you can. And that goes to something in preparing for the holidays. So I would ask all of you to think for a moment in what you would like to do this week. How would you like to spend your holiday? How can you stay connected? If you all just kind of reflect for that moment of what would it mean to feel connected to family or friends this week or to be a part of a virtual Seder? Is that something that your families are planning? Is that something that you can connect with through your synagogue? So just imagine what that might be like and imagine that this is option B. It may not be what you would ideally want, it may not give you that same sense of connection as with your family members in person, but it's the next best option under the circumstances. And I would love if anyone would like to share something that they may want to feel uh, or something that they're hoping to experience this week, that would be great as well. As ideas for Passover or what would help them feel more connected, that would be great. Um, we are doing a virtual Seder with my husband's family and I have teenage boys. So they're very excited about that because we see them every year. And then I had suggested, um, I have all these ideas because I teach and mm -hmm. I've been teaching online. So I suggested some time during the week of Passover, we do a virtual game night so that everybody can get on and play a game together. That's a great idea. And that's such a great way of showing ways that you can stay connected. Um, my brother and sister played Pictionary with their younger kids online. So there's a whiteboard on Zoom that you can play there or other games that you can play together is great. Thank you. In our case, uh, I, I think that the, the Seder has actually brought us closer together than we have been. Uh, we have a granddaughter who's in the Air Force in uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, she'll be joining us. Uh, I have a grandson who is involved with the Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. He will be joining us. We have my son-in-law's uh, niece who is in Iowa. Iowa, and she'll be joining us. Normally, yeah. she would fly in and stay here for a week and be part of it. But in the case of uh, Simona and Yissi, 
they just can't fly in mm -hmm. because they're working. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we think that this should be a very interesting Seder and I think a very positive one for a lot of people. That's amazing. And that's such a great point that this is a way that we may be able to connect with people who may not traditionally be able to come to our Seders. So it's a unique way to experience a holiday, but a way we really can stay connected and go through the same parts of the Seder that we would typically go through. In my family, we emailed a copy of the Haggadah if people didn't have it in their own home. So we all have the same one. We can print it out and all follow along together. So that's another idea if people don't have something to look at. And if you have family members who don't know how to Zoom or can't do the FaceTime technology, I think just having them on speakerphone, on a phone, uh, as a last resort if they can't do the visual, but at least having them as a part of that dinner so you can have this experience together. Well, Carrie, in my family, um, we, had, we had a birthday party, an 85th birthday party for my mother planned for earlier in March, which we canceled, but I had um, made a 10 pound brisket for that birthday party. Mm -hmm. So instead I put it in the freezer and what, what I did is last week I took it out so it could defrost. And then yesterday I cut it into five pieces and I drove around Monmouth County and I dropped mm -hmm. a piece off for each of the people who are going to be at the Seder. And my sister made chicken soup and she dropped that off for everybody. So we're all going to be eating the same food using the same Haggadah. And we're gonna be doing it on Zoom. And one of my cousins who lives in Boston, who would ordinarily never be with us on Passover, is gonna be on it because we're gonna be on Zoom. That's great. That's really great. Dr. Weiss, this is Tony Kessler. I have kind of a unique situation. My neighbor, uh, three doors down, I'm a, I'm a retired dentist, and he is a dentist that went to work and he got coronavirus. He's on a respirator now. And his wife and two daughters are two door, three doors down, and they are positive also, uh, and Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been walking around the neighborhood, though, walking the dogs. So I think they're not in such bad shape. But uh, any suggestions with the, I can do to help them out? Uh, one thing is to ask them uh, what they, if they need something, I think it's a great way to start, to let people know that you're thinking of them. Is there something that they need? Uh, could you drop off uh, any kind of meal for them that might help with planning the Cedar if they haven't been able to get anywhere and do any shopping? I think the most important thing is letting people know that we're thinking of them and that we care and we'd like to offer some help and see where they are with it. But I think it's great that you're thinking of them. So that would be my first suggestion. And I think right now it may be hard to go to stores or prepare something so having a way that they may have a part of a Seder or something traditional might be a nice way to do that for them. Thank you. Yep. I understand that Fred and Murray's is doing a full Passover meal and curbside pickup. So if you're in that Manalapan area, that's an option. That's a great idea. And then I wonder if any other places are, but that's Good really idea. helpful for people. Good idea, Lisa. <laughs> I believe Lock, Stock, and Deli in Mill, Milltown, like East Brunswick, is doing it. And um, yeah. They're right by Fred and Murray's. Got yeah. it. So that may be a helpful way to go and offer to have something dropped off for them. Yes, good idea. Good idea. A couple other questions that came in um, were sent in with the emails. One is a really good one is looking ahead at healthier times. How can we handle being in crowds again without feeling anxious about being infected? It's a great question. It's a hard one to answer fully because we don't know how long um, it's expected that things might be contagious or that the virus will still be circulating in the population. So I'm not sure how to answer that from the medical side of when it might be safe. But from the anxiety side, I think the most important part is that this is all going to be gradual. There isn't going to be an overnight lifting of all restrictions and we're suddenly in large group gatherings, again, feeling scared and feeling worried about being infected or what may be going on and will the rates start going up again. 
My guess is that restrictions will be lifted very slowly, which emotionally gives us time to emotionally prepare and slowly manage our anxiety and our feelings about being out again. Some things may always be different uh, or may be different for a while. There may not be the massive group gatherings. We may be more hesitant to have close contact and hug or shake hands with people that we're not close to and we're not sure of where they've been interacting. So I think there may be some precautions that we will take more seriously as we continue to move forward and hopefully move past what's been going on. Uh, but I think it's going to be that gradual building, which will let us manage the thoughts that we're having. It is hard when we're so used to staying inside and so protected to imagine being back out again. But if you imagine baby steps, each little step lets you build a little bit more of a feeling of safety and security. As we're listening to what the, the expectations are, I think really heeding medical advice, most importantly about knowing when it's safe to be socializing more and just gradually building up and becoming more and more comfortable over time. It's a, a big medical question in a lot of ways about when it's safe to do certain things. Another question that was sent in was what to do about guilt of trying to protect myself instead of being a hero for others. It's a good one because we all, I think, want to help other people and it feels good to feel like we're helping other people. Some of the comments that were just shared were so much about helping other people and that feels good. And sometimes when we feel helpless, we really want to help other people and make a difference. And all of those things are really positive. But as the, the famous saying always goes, you got to put on your own oxygen mask first. If you can't take care of yourself and if you're really struggling, you may not be able to help other people. So it's really, really important to take care of yourself and to give yourself permission that it's important, that it's okay, that you deserve to be taken care of, and that it's also okay to ask for help, to ask your family members if you are struggling for what you might need. Because if you're so used to helping others, or if you feel like you're usually that hero person and neglecting yourself, other people may not know when you're having a hard time. So being able to stop and say, I'm having a hard day today and I need this, and figuring out that language to communicate what you do need, and reminding yourself, acknowledging your own feelings, that it's okay and really important. If you can't, again, it's so important, if you can't take care of yourself, you won't have the energy or resources to help other people. And it also comes down to balance. Balance with taking care of your family members or taking care of other people in the community and also really being able to take care of yourself. So it doesn't have to be an either or. It's figuring out how can we do both. Uh, another question was how to handle awkwardness of asking friends to donate to COVID appeals. That may be knowing your audience somewhat and being able to communicate what needs are or posting things on your social media about appeals that, you may, be import that may be important to you and sort of the reasoning behind it or what those organizations are about without feeling pressure, without feeling that you're pressuring other people because everyone's economic situation might be different right now and we may not know. You may know some of the big ones if people are close to you and you know that they've lost their jobs, but we also don't know in smaller ways where people might be financially. So I think, again, it's balance of being able to make it known what appeals are out there and causes that are important to you and have meaning to you, but reminding yourself that you may not know where other people are and you don't want other people to feel pressured right now if they're struggling and may not want to be able to share that with you. Is hair involved with the virus? And I think that's going to be a more medical question. Um, in listening last night uh, with our um, infectious disease specialist, she seemed to talk more about the membranes and not about the hair as much, about uh, contagion going through the eyes, nose, and mouth. But I would really leave that more to medical doctors in terms of where uh, is the virus contagious and how does this spread. Um, so I would like to open it, Lisa, if there are more questions or if anyone would like to share 
what they may be feeling in terms of their stress and anxiety. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions that are there. My biggest fear, I have a 13 and a 16 year old. We had like the last bar mitzvah before everything shut down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and my 16 year old has said to me, I have asthma and RA and my 16 year old has expressed to me, he said, if I get sick and I give it to you, like something really bad could happen to you. And it's hard for me to respond that because I, to that because I have the same fears myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm terrified because I'm higher risk that if I get this virus, I'm going to leave my children motherless. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure how to deal with that. Which is really a scary feeling for you and for your kids. Uh, I think it's acknowledging those fears and continuing to do the best that you are and your kids are at keeping you um, socially distant and following all of the medical precautions and keeping you as safe as possible. Uh, a lot of the medical professionals have been recommending really taking the next two weeks very seriously and limiting um, some of the things where you might be around other people and wearing the face masks, um, even just the bandanas or facial coverings that may be more protective, especially uh, more for people who may be carriers than for you, but it's still, it still can be protective. So I think just reassuring yourself and your family members that we're doing everything that's in our power to keep ourselves safe. One of the things that we, we could do, uh, it's based upon uh, medical professionals that we know, including our, our daughter who uh, is working as one of the directors at a nursing home. When they come home, they go into, if they have a garage, they go into the garage, they take off their clothes, mm -hmm. uh, they, they go in the house, they take a shower, wash their hair, mm -hmm. and put on fresh clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have a, gar a garage, well, when you get in, stay at the door, do the same kind of a thing. They felt that this is helpful because it's mm -hmm. not bringing the, quote, germs into the household. So, mm -hmm. so I think if, you're, if you have to go into a store or an environment that you feel is not safe, if you follow that same precaution, you could probably feel that you're a little bit safer because if somebody sneezes, it will stay on your hair. <laughs> so if you can come home and wash it right away, mm -hmm. then you can be doing something to keep yourself a little bit safer if you have to go to environments like that. And all great ideas, just making sure you're washing your hands regularly. Nancy mm -hmm. said last night, making sure you're using warm water when you're washing your hands, that cold water won't kill the virus but warm water with a lot of friction with the soap is helpful. So the warm or hotter water that you can still tolerate. Showering is really important, taking your clothes off, getting it right into the washing machine. Um, showering so you feel clean and are limiting that as much as possible. Um, anything that you buy, leaving in the garage, if it's non-perishable, if it's perishable foods, making sure you're wiping everything down. Um, or having another family member wiping everything down for you to limit anything that might be coming into the house. And also, we're going to be posting last night's video. So for those of you who were with us last week for Dr. Kerry's part one of this stress series, you uh, probably received the video link from me the next day in an email. So we're going to be doing that again with tonight's session, but we had a session last night with an infectious diseases doctor, Nancy Gornish, and we will be posting her video link as well. So watch your emails, and um, so you'll get a lot of those tips directly from that video as well. And that, you know, following her recommendations may, may help. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that's important in terms of the anxiety piece of it is we're hearing all the numbers of positive cases. We're hearing the death rates and that's really, really scary and overwhelming. But we're not looking at the recovery rates that most people are not becoming infected. We can get very caught up in that tunnel vision of all the negative things that could happen. And sometimes it's important to look at most people are staying safe. Most people are staying protected. Most people who even do become positive are having very mild symptoms or there's a very high 
recovery rate. So keeping that in mind is really, really important right now to reassure yourselves and not just get caught up in all the fear thoughts. Bring yourself again back to the present. What are some alternative ideas? What are some alternative possibilities that could be happening? Uh, Lisa, um, I don't think we got that. I, I did get something which had a, re a review of, of uh, the first class and then registered with this class. I didn't take that as uh, a copy a of, there was no link that I saw at least to get the last, to get the last uh, session from a week ago Monday. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, will, I will double check that. Okay. Okay. Appreciate yep. it. You got it. We, we like to share. You got it. <laughs> Absolutely. I just wanted to mention that um, I've had to really stop watching TV as well. Mm -hmm. Like I check in on my phone once a day just to see what's going on and, and I read it. But I'm finding that, at it, especially in the evenings, every like commercial is about social distancing and coronavirus and there's just no break from it. It's like a constant barrage of it coming at you. Yes. And that's a great point. One, another big strategy is limiting your media exposure. So exactly what you're doing, maybe checking in once a day, twice a day at most, getting the updates that are important and limiting your media exposure. Because you're also getting, when you're watching TV, all the really, they want to get attention. That's what the TV news is about. So when you're watching those commercials or getting the highlight of what's coming in the nightly news, you're hearing the really scary numbers, the scary things that are going on, and that can just continue to increase anxiety. Last week we spoke about that if you're watching that nightly news and you're going to sleep hearing all of these scary things, that may also cause more restless sleep because the anxious thoughts, all those fears are staying more in your subconscious and are likely to uh, distract you and keep you from getting a restful night's sleep, which also increases anxiety when you're not feeling well rested and well taken care of. So limiting that news, limiting the constant media exposure is really, really essential for our well-being right now because it's just so much. And if you're finding that coming in the TV shows that you would traditionally watch, maybe DVR them. So you can just go um, fast forward through those commercials and not have the news at times that you don't want to see it. Um, watching other things, watching Netflix or other movies during that time, and then watching the shows that you like later on. So you're more in control of the news that you're getting to see. Any other questions? And then I also want to save some time to have us practice the guided imagery. This has been very, very good, uh, Terry, and I, I, I appreciate it. Really I'm do. glad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Guided, guided imagery? Yeah. Great. Okay, so I have a different one for us to try tonight. And this is a great strategy uh, to calm your brain, to calm your body, because it incorporates deep breathing, just letting your body slowly relax top to bottom, and focusing your mind on a different image. And when you focus your mind on that calming image, it distracts you from other thoughts that may be coming into your brain. So we're gonna start out now by getting into a comfortable position. I'm gonna give us some water sound effects to just help us with this. And if you can sit back and just gently close your eyes and listen to the sound of my voice as I guide you on a special relaxing journey. If you find yourself becoming distracted, just wriggle your toes, take a deep breath in and out and join us back on the journey wherever we might be at that moment. For a few moments, allow yourself to take several nice, long, deep breaths, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Breathing in and out. In and out. Keep breathing in and out, focusing on how your body feels at this very moment. As you inhale, feel the air filling your body. And as you exhale, feel your body release worries, tension, and stress. Feel the air fill your body 
and feel your body release all of the energy that no longer serves you. Relax your body by releasing any areas of tension. Allow your arms to go limp, then your legs to go limp. Feel your arms and legs becoming loose and relaxed. Now relax your neck and back by relaxing your spine, releasing the holes of your muscles all the way from your head down your neck. Slowly feeling the relaxation going down the length of your spine. Breathe deeply into your diaphragm, drawing air fully into your lungs and release the air with a deep whooshing sound. Breathe in again slowly, pause for a moment and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out, becoming more and more relaxed with each breath. Breathe out stress, breathe out tension. Feel your body giving up all the tension, becoming relaxed and calm and peaceful. Feel a wave of relaxation flow from the soles of your feet to your ankles, lower hips, lower legs, abdomen, chest, back, hands, lower arms, upper arms, shoulders, neck, back of your head, face, and the top of your head. Allow your entire body to rest heavily on the surface where you sit. Now that your body is feeling more and more relaxed, we're going to allow the visualization to begin. Imagine you are stepping into your shower, but know that this time the shower is magical. The water comes out at the perfect temperature. Just stand there and feel the warm water run over you. Keep your breathing relaxed so it's nice and deep and slow. The warm water washes away the worries, the stress, and the tension. Look down to your feet and see all of your worries, stress, and tension simply washing away. And now the magical water starts to change color. First, the water turns into a beautiful, vibrant red. The red water pours down and energizes you right to your core. Just stand there a moment and feel yourself infused with the beautiful, vibrant red. Feel this red color washing away all of your worries and fears. Without any resistance, they are simply washed down the drain and taken away. Release your worries and fears to the warm red water. And now you feel free from worries and fear. After a moment, the magical water starts to change color again. And this time, it becomes a brilliant shade of orange. Orange opens you to experience joy and allows you to release shame and guilt. Feel the orange wash over you. Feel the orange color wash through you, washing away all that no longer serves, making more space for calm and joy. Now the magical water becomes a bright shade of yellow. Feel the yellow water cleanse emotional pain. 
realize that some things are out of your control and you can best handle them when you are calm and collected. Feel your body strengthen and become more secure. Yellow clears the mind and invigorates the soul. Take a nice deep breath and feel the clarity within. Now the magical water turns to a brilliant shade of green, balancing and restoring the physical body. Green purifies the body, renewing your expression of love and forgiveness. Just as you love, you are loved. Feel the green water open your heart to all the love you deserve. Know that you are connected to all. Next, the magical water changes to a beautiful, cooling, magical blue. The blue enhances self-expression, allowing you to speak your truth, your universal truth. Feel the blue all around you, allowing you to express yourself according to your true self. Tilt your head back so the blue water falls on your neck, letting the warm water relax all of the muscles of your neck, breathing in and out freely. The magical water changes color again. It now changes to a color containing indigo and purple. Feel it land on your crown and wash all over you. Indigo and purple stimulate your own healing power and wisdom. Feel the calming influence of the velvet dark colors of indigo and purple. And finally, the magical water turns to a brilliant glowing white light. Feel it embrace you, warm and pure. This heavenly white takes away any pain and heals your hurt. It shows you the peace and joy within your own spirit. Take this moment to enjoy the white light that surrounds you, that fills you, that holds you secure. Enjoy this feeling. Enjoy being yourself. And as you bathe in the white light, know that you are cleansed inside and out in body, mind, and spirit. You are standing in peace and harmony with yourself and the world, both physical and spiritual. So appreciate this last bit of the magical color shower. Take a few refreshing breaths before you turn off the water and step out of the shower. Slowly breathing in and breathing out. As you towel yourself dry in your imagination, feel your body, feel that your muscles are relaxed, feel that your energy has been revitalized, feel that your spirits are fresh, your mind is clear, and you are looking forward to what is to come. For a moment, be aware of how deeply relaxed your mind and body feel. Remind yourself that you can create these feelings on your own. Remember that whenever you're feeling tense or stressed and need to take a break, you can bring yourself back to this magical shower to relax, refresh, 
and calm your mind and your body. It's now time to come back into the present space. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Take another deep breath in and let it out. Become conscious of your breath, feeling invigorated. Wriggle your toes, wriggle your fingers, and when you feel ready, slowly open your eyes and welcome back to our present space. Would anyone like to share how that felt for them? It was very relaxing. Good. Were you able to feel and imagine the shower in the different colors? More than I've ever been able to imagine anything before. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, good. Yes. oh, that's great. Yes, it's very good. Uh, if I can say something, this is, uh, I had a heart attack back in 1987. And one of the people who helped me was someone like you, Kerry, who uh, I did this with. And I, I have to say, this is extremely refreshing and, uh, and very, very good, very satisfying. Oh, good. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. It, for me, it made me very emotional. Um, mm -hmm. It was almost a little bit of a release. I found myself like almost crying at certain times. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing now it's probably because I have like all this anxiety pent up inside and I just keep going and doing what I need to do. And I don't take any time to let it kind of be. Mm -hmm. So really a good reminder for you that when all that anxiety builds up, it's so important to give yourself a little space to have that release. So I'm glad you were able to have a release and it brought up some stuff for you that you needed to let out. Yep. Thank you. So these are really helpful things to do the guided imagery. I think it's particularly helpful before bedtime if you're feeling a lot of stress building up during the day. Um, those apps, Calm and Headspace are two really great ones to have the guided imagery. They have lots of different scripts and scenes that they take you through. Um, so those are some good places to, to take you through it and have some calm, relaxing time before bedtime. I just wanted to share that there's also a website called healthjourneys.com and I've bought a lot of guided imagery from there as well. Um, some of it they use in hospitals and medical facilities, but um, they have a lot of very good resources if people want it, want to download something instead. That's good. Thank you. Now I know that I'm ready to get into bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for relaxing me. You are welcome. And Kerry, thank you for giving this to the Jewish community. Um, giving so generously of your time and your talents and your insights. Thank and um, it really just, it, I'm very moved by it and it means the world. And thank you. No, thank you so much for having me and I'm glad I can help and do uh, a piece of helping others get through this difficult time. So thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for being here to support one another and for being part of a caring community. And um, we have each other that hasn't changed and Federation has our back and that hasn't changed. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you or someone you know is in need. And um, we're, we're getting through this day at a time together. Yep. Good night, everyone. Good night.